Who are these romance scammers, and who's the woman the scammers love to use to lure unsuspecting men? Let's get right to it with... Number four. That's my girlfriend, too! Florida-based former adult star Janessa Brazil has been the face of romance scams for over a decade. Scammers used photos and videos taken from her time in the adult entertainment industry to lure catfishing victims into romance scams. The fraudsters would upload her image onto their fake online profiles and use it to prey upon unsuspecting individuals looking for love. Since the mid-2000s, Janessa's face has appeared on over 100,000 social media accounts. In other situations, a model would be delighted to have their image shared worldwide. For Janessa, being used as bait for online scams dismantled her career. As the face of so many scams, her inboxes were flooded with accusations from victims over lost money and ruined lives. As a victim herself, the situation took a massive toll on Janessa's mental health and affected her marriage. And if you don't want to be a victim, we highly recommend our sponsored advertiser for today's video, Aura. One third of all Americans have experienced some form of identity theft. That means you have a higher likelihood of falling prey to identity theft at some point in your life than you do getting into a car crash. Additionally, 46% of people who use social media are at even greater risk of having their personal details stolen than those who don't use social media. These problems run rampant because the data brokering industry makes a killing selling your information, like where you live, to scammers and cold Old callers. The good news is, brokers are legally obliged to remove your information if you tell them to. Bad news, they make it incredibly difficult to do so. That's why we at Peblito's Way have partnered with Aura, an AI-powered all-in-one app that proactively protects your family, your identity, and your assets. Once you've started using Aura, you're going to rest easy knowing your personal info is being removed from data brokers and personal search sites, the same sites that sell your info to identity thieves and scammers. With Aura, you will be protected. And in this day and age, it's a no-brainer to have online protection. They'll keep your money safe so you can make more of it. If you sign up today, you'll get a free two-week trial to increase the safety of you and your loved ones. Just visit Aura.com slash Pablito or click on the link in the description or comment section below. Now, let's get back to Janessa and her story. Janessa resorted to drinking heavily before her shows until 2016 when she couldn't take it any longer and quit. She left her home and her marriage and ran away to pursue a new life. Love Janessa, a BBC podcast presented by investigative reporter Hannah Ajala, told listeners about Janessa's plight. Ajala traveled worldwide from the UK, Italy, West Africa, and the United States. She examined how scammers hid behind Janessa's face to steal huge sums of money, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. The podcast also featured Simon de Bruels, a fellow journalist who almost fell prey to a fraudster using Janessa's images, causing him to investigate the case further. While the scammers lived around the globe, many lived in West Africa. The BBC tracked down a Ghanaian group of fraudsters called the Sakawa Boys, where at least one admitted to impersonating Janessa online. The real Janessa was much harder to find than her fake personas, and it took the Love Janessa podcast nine months to track her down. In her interview, she stated she removed her online presence in 2016 to prevent scammers from taking more of her images. Those that have fallen victim to scam artists using Janessa's image branded her a modern Helen of Troy. In Greek mythology, Helen of Troy was the world's most beautiful woman, and her abduction prompted the Trojan War. In Janessa's case, fake profiles used her images to lure men into fake online relationships and manipulate them into parting with their hard-earned money. With the damage the fake profiles caused, the real Janessa has been forced to take some of the blame. A court in Florida banned Janessa from posting anything on the internet after a man she had never met came forward to say that she convinced him to send her $2 million. The real woman behind the scandal is Vanessa, who used the alter ego Janessa Brazil when she worked as a cam girl. For about eight years, she streamed explicit content online, which her fans paid $20 per minute to watch. Her career grew into a successful brand. She had her own website and a strong online 
presence. At her peak, she earned around a million dollars annually. That was until her images and videos became bait. To provide justice for victims of fake Janessa, Vanessa has been trying to combat people pretending to be her. As well as her decision to stop making online content, she would respond to messages she received from victims to warn them that they had fallen for a catfishing scam. She avoided going to the police, fearing they wouldn't take her situation seriously. One of the fake Janessa victims was Roberto Marini, an Italian man in his early 30s. While he fell for Janessa's face, he thought he was speaking to a woman named Hannah. Three months into their relationship, Hannah began asking for money. At first, the requests were small, like needing cash to fix her phone. However, soon she was asking for hundreds of thousands of dollars. Marini was in love and wanted to help his online girlfriend, but hated that she never wanted to talk on the phone. Eventually, he discovered that Hannah's images were of Janessa and that he'd blown a significant amount of cash. In 2016, when she fled to start a new life, she hoped her absence would remove the scammer's power to use her image for deception. We're relieved that we've actually been dating the real Janessa the whole time. Number three, Casanova Coombs. For decades, serial con man David Coombs stole thousands of dollars from his victims after befriending and seducing them. Many men and women fell for his charming ways, and his years of lies and deception earned him the nickname Casanova Coombs. Despite stealing significant money from people, Coombs claimed he hated living off their cash, and everyone believes him. Coombs blamed his low confidence for his crimes, claiming it compelled him to offend repeatedly. Coombs stated his behavior was rooted in the belief he wasn't good enough for anyone, so apparently he thought stealing all their money would change that? One of Coombs' victims, Carol Ann, was drawn to Coombs after they became friends. She thought he was a genuine, caring man whom she trusted. Coombs claimed he knew of a place Carol Ann could rent and requested she give him the money for the deposit so he could put it down on her behalf. Carol gave him $621, but Coombs promptly spent it and never paid her back. Coombs' life of crime caught up to him in 2017 when a judge sentenced him to four years in jail for multiple fraud offenses. Coombs served a portion of his sentence and was granted early release on license, meaning he had to follow certain conditions like regular meetings with his community offender manager. According to Coombs, the meetings with his community offender manager made him anxious. So he did what most people with anxiety do. He ran away to Turkey and Russia. To Two places clearly known for their calming effect and chilled out vibes, and he stayed for two years. Coombs had started a relationship with a woman named Olga, whom he started messaging when he was on license. Coombs claimed she tried to coerce him out of $2,500, but as a career criminal, he knew her game. In response, Olga turned the situation around, blaming him and forcing him to confront the kind of person he was, which caused him to realize that he didn't want to be that person anymore. However, with Coombs' skills of deception and manipulation, the accuracy of his version of events was questionable. His escape to Russia violated the terms of his license, resulting in the extension of his sentence. During Coombs' parole hearing, the parole board heard from his victims and his community offender manager. After reviewing his case, the board rejected his requests as they feared he was capable of bad behavior. The psychologist reviewing Coombs' case described him as a coercive and controlling, which were traits he hadn't tried to fix, and stated he posed a high level of danger for coercing new victims. As a result, of his absconding to Russia and fears of his behavior if he were to be released, the court extended his sentence in 2020. They should just send him back to Olga, though. We know nothing about her, but we feel she's a stout, short woman with a slight mustache and a bad attitude. Olga's not someone to be trifled with. Number two, the worst boyfriend. In the summer of 2018, Rochelle, a woman in her 70s nearing retirement, joined the dating website Our Time, where she met Nelson Roth. The pair shared an instant connection, and Nelson seemed to be falling in love with Rochelle. He would brag to her about his lavish lifestyle in multiple homes. Within a few weeks of dating, Nelson organized a meeting with a high-end New York City broker to look into Connecticut real estate. However, he didn't attend the meeting and asked Rochelle to go in his place and not mention him. That request was just the beginning of his strange behavior. Soon, Rochelle was out tens of thousands of dollars to a man that was nothing of what he seemed. Nelson created a strong perception of wealth. He presented himself
himself as a well-connected, wealthy businessman, boasting about his expensive possessions and relationships with influential people. Nelson's apparent wealth lured his victims, which he used to gain their trust. But it was an illusion, and his victims funded his extravagant lifestyle. Nelson frequently borrowed money from those around him, especially Rochelle. Early in their relationship, Nelson approached Rochelle in a distressed state, claiming he needed to make an important purchase. It was a Friday night, meaning his broker was inaccessible, and he wouldn't have the money in time for the transaction. Nelson just needed $7,000, which Rochelle didn't have that kind of money on hand, but her daughter, Julia, did. He promised to pay the money back on Monday, plus an extra 500 bucks. Julia was already suspicious of her mother's new love interest and was furious that he asked to borrow money. She reluctantly handed over the cash, but had a bad feeling about the situation. Nelson didn't have the money when Monday arrived and had a new excuse for the late repayment with every day that passed. When he claimed he had been in the hospital for heart problems, Julia called the hospital to verify he was there. They told her they didn't have a patient named Nelson Roth, but he said they wouldn't have his information on hand as he was on a VIP floor. Duh. Convinced her mother was being deceived, Julia didn't understand why Rochelle was still dating Nelson in November 2018. Her boyfriend, Nate, stole Nelson's cell phone one night after dinner and took it into the bathroom to check his texts. Text exchange between Rochelle and Nelson revealed that Nelson owed Rachel $60,000. Rochelle repeatedly asked for the money back and Nelson became irate. Julia had no clue how much debt her mother was in and contacted a private investigator to find out who Nelson Roth truly was. The PI discovered that Roth Roth's real name was Nelson Kuhn, a man convicted for grand larceny on at least three occasions. Each time, he was manipulating people into believing they were investing money in lucrative business deals. And Rochelle was far from his only victim. Personal trainer Christy fell in love with the con man during the early 2000s and lost tens of thousands of dollars in the process. Television executive Ethel was out 250000 bucks due to Nelson, and he allegedly stole a diamond necklace and diamond ring from a woman named Virginia Gregory. In March 2023, at least five Manhattan women accused Nelson of stealing $1.8 million from them when he posed as a wealthy art collector and investor on his online dating profiles. Nelson allegedly convinced the women to invest in phony companies and use the money the women sent to repay previous victims to maintain his illusions of wealth, Ponzi style. He used aliases like Nelson and Justin Roth, targeting lonely women he believed he could manipulate. As he did to his other victims, Nelson pitched investment opportunities early in their relationships despite having none of the wealth or assets he claimed to have, like the homes in London and the South France. Later, the women learned that the real Nelson didn't even have a passport. The investment opportunities he presented to the women included a phony startup he claimed to co-own with a former Google executive and the opportunity to invest in the Alibaba Group, a well-known Chinese multinational conglomerate. Nelson followed a pyramid scheme approach by using money from new investors to repay old investors while keeping a cut of the funds for himself. Nelson was arraigned on an indictment in the Manhattan Supreme Court, and if convicted, faces significant jail time. Before we get to number one, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay for our past release about Ruben Sarpong and how he scammed all his sugar mamas. Number one, Kofi Osei, Romance Scammer. Kofi Osei, a man from Massachusetts, catfished women on dating websites into sending him over $1 million. Between 2016 and 2019, Osei's victims sent over $4 million, with at least three women sending over half a million each. He opened multiple accounts on online dating websites and used fake identities to open bank accounts. Once Osei received the funds from his victims, he would withdraw it in cash and use it to purchase cashier checks or spend it on personal expenses. For a while, Osei posed as a man working on an overseas oil rig and used multiple fake names to lure his victims. Once he established a relationship, he would claim he needed financial assistance for medical emergencies, legal problems, or accidents on the rig. He arranged to meet at least one of his victims in Florida, but canceled the meeting, saying there was an explosion on the rig and he was in police custody in Dubai. Osei asked his stood-up victim for funds to pay his attorney fees, to which the woman transferred $36,000 into his bank account. The same woman sent two wire transfers that totaled $125,000 to Osei, and he'd spent almost 120 grand within three days. Osei took a total of $161,000 from the woman. For his next scam, Osei created a profile on the dating site Plenty of Fish, where he posed as a man named William Woodcox. He targeted a woman from Montecito, California, and gained her trust by talking to her over email and telephone. Osei claimed he was working in France and that there was an accident at his workplace. He asked the woman to 
send him money to help out the injured. So she sent over $65,000. Osei used Plenty of Fish to create another profile under the name Harry Mikasell. This time he targeted a woman from Bradenton, Florida and told her he worked on a drilling platform in Houston, Texas. He convinced her to send him funds for drilling equipment and made her his power of attorney on his company's bank account in the Bahamas. Osei told her that the business account was frozen and asked her to pay to unfreeze it. She ultimately sent him $270,565. In February 2021, authorities searched Osei's residence and car where they discovered fake identity documents under the names and several aliases. Osei opened over 40 bank accounts using at least seven aliases. Osei pleaded guilty to seven counts of making false statements to a bank, six counts of wire fraud, and two counts of money laundering. Is it ironic that he catfished someone on Plenty of Fish? Between January 2016 and September of 2019, Rubin Sarpong and his squad worked together to scam women in New Jersey and the surrounding area on online dating apps. His accomplices lived in Ghana while he lived in the US. What he and the team would do is set up fake dating profiles all over the place on various dating websites such as Plenty of Fish, OkCupid, and Tinder. Sarpong would routinely hit up women on online dating sites looking for romance. Whatever platform form you could think of, he was on there messaging women. He would message and quickly sweet talk women looking for love. But then he quickly turned the conversation into a promise of getting rich. It goes without saying that they would always use a fake person identity. Sometimes they'd go through the trouble of making fake IDs as well. They also had to set up numerous email addresses, numerous phone numbers, and numerous bank accounts. And most of the time, they posed as US military personnel stationed overseas. But why the military? Simply put, it's because of the fact that being in the military just makes things much easier for scammers in general. It's actually quite smart for the scammers. The fact that military personnel are stationed outside the US makes it easy for scammers to make up excuses why they don't have something a normal person would have when someone asks them questions. They can just blame everything on the fact that they're overseas in the military. Plus, there's the whole secrecy thing they can play up with the government at play. Hundreds of times a day, women all over the world are being conned by scammers posing as US service members. This is according to Chris Gray from the US Army Criminal Investigation Command. They literally get hundreds of calls a day about dating scams. Most of the victims are women in the US. They mostly range from their late 30s to late 70s. You'd think that it would be someone who's dumb and uneducated. Nope. Gray says that education doesn't matter. Plenty of highly educated people get scammed as well. According to Gray, there's one easy step to avoid getting scammed by a military imposter. Just ask to be sent an email from his or her military account ending in .mil. Gray says the scammers will do everything they can to get around this email check. They'll quickly just make up another lie, such as saying they're on a top secret mission. Hotspots for online romance scams include Nigeria and other countries in West Africa. But today, there's only a small number of personnel in the West African region. For example, fewer than 50 military and civilian employees and contractors are in Nigeria. After Sarpong establishes some virtual sparks with the women, this is when the real work starts. He starts asking them for help in the form of money. For Sarpong, gold was always involved. Sarpong would make up that money was needed for the purpose of paying to get gold bars into the US. The stories that Sarpong and his team use aren't the same every time. They tailor it for each woman. Most of the time, Sarpong would claim to be a soldier stationed in Syria. He'd say he either received, found, or was awarded gold bars. He's now rich, but he had a problem. He didn't have enough cash on hand to ship the gold bars himself. There were taxes to be paid, shipping fees, and other fake invoices that needed to be paid in order to get the gold to the US. You tell the women that their money would be returned once the gold bars were back to the States, and of course, they'd get a lot more money back for their efforts. Let's get into some details with the scam. One unidentified and unfortunate lady we'll call scammed victim number one went back and forth with Sarpong. He told her that he was stationed in Syria and his unit had received millions of dollars worth of gold bars. He told this lady that he was given one of the boxes of gold and that box was worth $12 million. Why do people fall for this? Has anyone heard of the military ever giving away gold bars to soldiers? Anyways, 
Sarpong started asking her if she could help him get the bars back to the U.S. once he knew she was hooked. And this is where Sarpong usually has the ladies talk to one of his team members just so they could build some trust in the ladies' minds. In this specific instance, someone on his squad posed as a diplomat named Alwyn Rolf Liss. He was supposed to help her help Sarpong with the transfer of the gold back to the U.S. The fake diplomat would have the perfect answer for every one of her questions. How come Liss didn't have his own U.S. bank account? Because he wasn't a U.S. citizen. So he had the victim wire her money to his secretary's bank account. He told her this was the account he used whenever he arranged gold deliveries for people. Of course, that bank account actually belonged to Sarpong. Even after the victim wired the money over, they would keep talking to her. Why would they do this? If they found someone who would send money one time, why wouldn't they send money a second time, or a third time, or maybe a fourth time? The money just keeps coming until the women realize they're getting scammed. Basically, they're going for max value per scam here. A few days later, fake diplomat Liss told victim number one the good news. He would be flying from Syria to New York and then to Maryland with the gold. He emailed a copy of a fake airway bill that showed the two trunks with the quote, family treasure that were being shipped to her. The fake airway bill had her address on it. They really tried to make it seem like she was getting the gold. He was listed as the delivery agent, but there was one problem. There would be extra costs. Liss also attached a copy of a fake United Nations identity card that showed that he was an Israeli citizen and an official delivery agent for the UN. Also, he told her that way she would recognize him when she picked him up at the airport. From approximately May 22, 2018 to June 12, 2018, Sarpong and his scam team successfully scammed almost $94,000 from this particular lady running this usual military play. But Sarpong didn't always go after women. And he didn't always use the military. He went after at least one man. Sarpong pretended to be a lady who was living in Florida in one instance. Sarpong played a lady who was waiting on a large inheritance that was mostly in gold from her dad's estate in Ghana. Because whose dad wouldn't have their assets mostly in gold? We'll call this guy scammer victim number two, or number two for short. Sarpong told number two an attorney named Mumani Muhammad was helping her get her inheritance to the U.S., but she needed funds in order to cover the court costs, airway bills, document fees, export fees, and taxes. She's now rich, but she just didn't have the cash on hand. Their scam is just a spinoff of the Nigerian prince scam, right? Muhammad had instructed number two to wire the money to Sarpong, who Muhammad would refer to as one of his sons in New Jersey. And when number two asked why his son had a different last name, he would just make up a different lie. You would think these scammers would be extremely careful, but they're really not. They make up a lot of sophisticated sounding lies, but they still make mistakes on the fly. But what helps them also is just the little glimmer of hope for love and money from the victim. Muhammad ended up making up the excuse that Sarpong was someone who used to work for him and that he misspoke. This guy still sent the money anyway. All for the hope of even more money coming back, along with getting to help someone who he thinks is a real woman. Number two eventually wired a little over $300,000 to Sarpong and his team. Of the roughly $2.1 million that they were able to scam out of people, about 40% went to Sarpong and the remaining money went to the rest of the team. So what did Sarpong do with his portion? If you check out Sarpong's Instagram, he was definitely desperate for attention. You can just tell that he wanted the world to know that he was living it up. He craved that validation of a successful businessman. Funny thing is, is that no one really paid attention. None of his posts have that many likes. Ultimately, he did these scams and made some money. Instead of saving the money and trying not to get caught, here he was blowing the money on random frivolous things and posting it online. It's like he almost wanted to get caught. Investigators eventually caught on to Sarpong and his team. They said that he was the ringleader of the international operation that scammed over 30 women. He was charged in federal court with just a single count of conspiracy to commit wire fraud. And he was the only one actually charged because everyone else was international. Here's the craziest thing. He actually asked the judge to assign him to a public defender. Why? Because he claimed he didn't have enough money to pay for a lawyer. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section, what's an easier scam to fall for in your opinion? A romance scam or a phishing scam?